what don't I get? You know, why is your criticism of me and Murray valid? I mean, just give me your take on all of this. All right. Well, I appreciate that summary. Um, obviously, and I'm sure we'll get into this stuff. I have uh, d disagreements with which articles are fair and which aren't, but I don't think that that is where I want to begin this. I'm sure we'll go through that. I want to try to frame what I want to do here today, uh, because I think people can go through, they can read the original Vox articles, all be linked in my show notes. I, I assume, Sam, they'll be linked in yours. They can read our emails to each other. They can read my article. Um, they can listen to the original podcast. If you would like to be a Sam Harris and Ezra Klein completist, the, the, the option is very much there. So I, I listened to your uh, housekeeping episode the other day um, where, so I think I have some sense, Sam, of, of where you are coming into this. And, and I want to give you a sense of where I am in, in the hopes that it'll be productive. So something you've said over and, and over and over again to me uh, at this point is that to you from the beginning, I've been here in bad faith. The, the, the problem is that I've come to this, coming to, to slander you, to destroy your reputation, to silence you. And I really, I, I take that as a signal failure on my part. Um, I have not been able to persuade you, and, and maybe I will be today, that I really disagree with you uh, strongly. I think some of the, the, the things you're trafficking in are not just wrong, but they're harmful. But I, I do so in good faith, and, and I'm here because I want to persuade you. Um, in your podcast with Murray, the, the way I see what's going on here, from, from my perspective, and one of the tricky things here is that I was not that involved in the original Vox article. I was editor-in-chief at the time, but I didn't assign or edit that. I stand by it. Things you publish when you're editor-in-chief ultimately are, are on you, and I actually think it's a good piece. But I, there are times when I can only speak from my perspective, not from the perspective of, of, of other people who wrote other things. But the way I read the conversation you had with Murray, and, and I think you gesture at this in your opening here, you begin that conversation by really framing it around your shared experience responding to politically correct criticism. You, you say, and I'm quoting you here, uh, in the intervening years, so the intervening years since Murray published The Bell Curve, that you ventured into, I ventured into my own controversial areas as a speaker and writer. I experienced many hysterical attacks against me and my work. I started thinking about your case, your case being Murray's case, a little, again, without ever having read you. And I began to suspect that you were one of the canaries in the coal mine that I never recognized as such. So you say explicitly in the opening to that podcast that in the treatment of Murray, you saw the seeds of later treatment of you. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about this because something that, that, that I've been trying to do here is see this from your perspective. Here is my view. I think you have, you, you clearly have, a deep empathy for Charles Murray's side of this conversation be, because you see yourself in it. I don't think you have as deep an empathy for the other side of this conversation, for the people being told once again, that they are genetically and environmentally and at any rate immutably less intelligent and that our social policy should reflect that. And, and I think part of the absence of that empathy is it doesn't threaten you. I don't, I don't think you see a threat to you in that in the way you see a threat to you in what's happened to Murray. In some cases, I'm not even quite sure you heard what Murray was saying on social policy, either in the bell curve and a lot of his later work or on the podcast. And I think that led to a blind spot in this it's worth discussing. I like your podcast. Uh, I, I think you have a big platform and a big audience, and I think it's bad for the world if Murray's take on this gets recast here as political bravery or impartial or non-controversial. So what I want to do here, uh, it's not really convince you that I'm right. I don't think I'm going to do that. And it's not to convince you to like me. I don't think I'm going to do that either. I get that. What I want to convince you of is that there's a side of this you should become more curious about. You should be doing shows with people like Ibram Kendi, who's author of Stamp from the Beginning, which is a book on, on racist ideas in America, which won the National Book Award a couple of years back. People who really study how race and these ideas interact with American life and policy. I think the fact that we are two white guys talking about how growing up non-white in America affects your life and cognitive development is a problem here, just as it was a problem in the Murray conversation. And I want to persuade you that, that some of the things that the so-called social justice warriors are worried about are worth worrying about. And that the excesses of activists, while, while very real and problematic, they're not as big a deal as the things they're really trying to fight and to draw attention to. So maybe I'll take a breath there and, and, and let you in. Yeah. OK, that's a great start. So I guess there's a lot to respond to there. I guess the, the first thing I want to say is that there are two things I regret here, both in our exchange and in my podcast with Murray. And 
So I should just put those out first, I think. The first is that I was, as you said, very quick to attribute malice and bad faith to you in the email exchange. And it's quite possible I did this when it wasn't warranted. The reality is the background here, which you alluded to, is that I am so battle scarred at this point, and I've dealt with so many people who are willing to consciously lie about my views and who will just play the evasion game endlessly. I mean, I've got people who edit the contents of my podcast to make it sound like I've said the opposite of what I've said. And then people like Glenn Greenwald and Reza Aslan forward these videos, consciously knowing they're misrepresenting me. I mean, there's been so much pushback about this. There's been so much correction that at this point, the possibility that it's not conscious, the chance of that is zero, right? So I'm dealing with people on a daily basis who are just happy to smear me dishonestly simply to see what will stick. And in fact, when I published our emails, the tipping point for me was to see that Glenn Greenwald, Reza Aslan, and you in a single hour on Twitter had all hit me with stuff that I perceived to be totally dishonest. So my fuse is pretty short. I am the first to admit that. And if I treated you unfairly, attributing bad faith when you were just led by sincere conviction that I had made an error or that you were arguing for something that was so important and that I wasn't seeing it, that's, you know, that is on me. Now, that said, I think your argument is where even where it pretends to be factual, wherever you think it is factual, it is highly biased by political considerations. And these are political considerations that I share. The fact that you think I don't have empathy for people who suffer just the starkest inequalities of wealth and politics and luck, it's telling and it's untrue. I think it's even untrue of Murray. And the fact that you're conflating the social policies he endorses, like the fact that he's against affirmative action and he's for universal basic income. And I know you don't happen to agree with those policies. You think that would be disastrous. There's a good faith argument to be had on both sides of that conversation. That conversation is quite distinct from the science. And even that conversation about social policy can be had without any allegation that a person is racist or that a person lacks empathy for people who are at the bottom of, of society. So that's one distinction I want to make. And the other thing that I regret, which I think is, this is the thing you're taking me to task for, and I understand it, but I do regret that in the preface to my podcast with Murray, I didn't add some full discussion of racism in America. And the reason why I didn't, or certainly at least one reason why I didn't, is that I had, you know, maybe two months before that, done a podcast with Glenn Lowry, the economist at Brown, who happens to be black. And I mean, Glenn is fantastic. He's got his own podcast, The Glenn Show, which everyone should watch. But so Glenn was on my podcast, and we were talking about race and violence in America. And I prefaced the conversation with a fairly long statement about the reality of white privilege and the past horrors of racism. And when I got to the end of it, Glenn pretty much chastised me for thinking that it was necessary for me to say something like that just because I'm white, right? The fact that any conversation about race and violence, especially coming from a white guy like me, has to be bracketed with some elaborate virtue signaling on that point. So he basically said, I mean, these aren't his words, but this was his attitude basically said, you know, obviously, since you're not a racist asshole, it can go without saying that you understand that slavery was bad and that Jim Crow was bad and that you totally support civil rights. And so his take on my saying that, it was not a total surprise given who Glenn is, but the fact that he viewed it as fairly pathetic that I felt the need to do that and that it couldn't just go without saying, I remembered that. And I mean, obviously, your point is well taken. I mean, two white guys talking about differences in IQ across races or across populations. I mean, if ever there's a time to signal that you understand that racism is still a problem in the world, that's it, right? And while we did say some things that I think should still have been fully exculpatory, I mean, for anyone paying attention, I think it should be obvious with a modicum of charity extended to us that Murray and I are not racist, and that what we were saying was not coming from a place of racial animus. But 
I mean, that is the backstory for why I didn't have some kind of elaborate framing of the conversation. So I want to I want to be uh, this is good because I think this gets much closer to the meat of where we actually disagree. And something I want to be clear about is what I think was wrong in that podcast is not that you didn't virtue signal. It's not that you didn't come out and say, hey, listen, just before I start this up, I want everybody to know I'm not a racist. And by the way, I'm not here to say you're a racist. I don't think you are. We have not called you one. Um, I actually think that's a different set of things. And we should talk later. I think this would actually be a good conversation for us to have about literally just what racism is, how we use that word in this conversation. But my criticism of your podcast, and by the way, my criticism also of Murray, and, and, and this is useful because I can work backwards through your answer here, is not that you didn't excuse yourself. It's that in a conversation about an outcome of American life, right? How do African-Americans and whites score on IQ tests in America today? What happens when somebody sits down and takes a test today? That is an outcome of the American experiment, an experiment we've been running in this country for hundreds of years. You did not discuss actually how race and racism act upon that outcome. You did not discuss, I mean, amazingly to me, you all didn't talk about slavery or segregation once. And what I'm saying here is not that you lack empathy, although I, I am saying in a, a different space, I don't, I think you have a, like an, a, an, a sense of what Murray's going through that is different from your sense of what other people who are hurt in this conversation go through. I do believe that. But as it comes to the way you actually conducted the conversation, I'm arguing that you lacked a sense of history that you didn't deal in a serious way with the history of this conversation, a conversation that has been going on literally since the dawn of the country, a conversation that has been wrong in virtually every version, in every iteration we've had in America before. The other thing I want to say about this, and this gets very importantly to, to Charles Murray's work, you're a neuroscientist. And so I get that you look at Murray and you look at the bell curve and what you see are the, the tables and the appendices and, and the kind of scientific version of Charles Murray. I'm a policy journalist. My background is I'm, I live in Washington, D.C. I cover politics. Charles Murray, not just to me, what he literally is, is a what we call a policy entrepreneur. He's somebody who his entire career has been spent at Washington think tanks. He's at the American Enterprise Institute, where I have a lot of friends, and, and I respect that organization quite a bit. And he argues in different ways and throughout his, in, again, his entire uh, body of work for policy outcomes. His book before the bell curve is called Losing Ground. It's a book about why we should dissolve the great society programs. Um, by the way, when he was selling that book, he said, a lot of whites think they're racist. And this is a book that tells them they aren't. Then he came out with the bell curve. And, and we'll go through this and I'll quote this back to you. But the bell curve's final chapter. He says, why did I do any of this? Why did, why did I talk about any of this? Him and Richard Hernstein, uh, obviously the co-author of that book, do. And he says, the reason I did it is because we in America need to re-embrace a politics of difference. We need to understand that we are cognitively different from each other, um, not just by race, but, but, but other folks too, but, but, but by race as well. And that understanding that changes what we should do in social policy. He literally says, and, and again, I can quote this too if you'd like, he says, for one thing, we have all these low cognitive capacity women giving birth. And by having these social supports for poor children in this country, we are subsidizing them to give birth. And what we need to do is take those subsidies away. So these women who, according to his book, are disproportionately African-American, their poor children do not get as much federal support when they are born. And so they are disincentivized to have as many children. He also says that we have all these folks who are Hispanic coming up over the border, that our immigration policy is letting in too many low IQ people. And while he's not quite as prescriptive in that part, he's pretty clear that he wants us to change our immigration policy okay. uh, in order to resist dysgenic pressure. So I'm just going to finish this up. The other thing, you brought up his UBI work. And, and this is why the reason I bring this up is that the reason I think Charles Murray's work is problematic is that he uses these arguments about IQ and a lot of other arguments he makes about other things to push these points into the public debate, where he is very, very, very influential. He's not by any means a silenced actor in Washington. He, he gives congressional testimony. He won the Bradley Prize in 2016 and got a $250,000 check for it. His book on UBI, it is completely of a piece with this. I reviewed that book when it came out. It's an interesting book. People should read it. 
but it is a way of cutting social spending according to Murray's own numbers. He says it would cut social spending by a trillion dollars in 2020. To give you a sense of scale, Obamacare costs $2 trillion over 10 years. So this is another book in a different way that is a huge argument for cutting social spending, which in part he justifies by saying, we are trying to redress racial inequality based on an idea that is a product of American history when in fact it is some combination of innate and environmental, but at any rate, it is not something we're going to be able to change. And so we should stop trying, or at least stop trying in the way we have been. Okay, Ezra, again, you can't conflate his views on social policy with an honest discussion of empirical science. Those are two separate conversations. You can agree about the data or disagree in a good faith way about the data and have a separate conversation about what to do in response to the data and then disagree in a good faith way about that. Now, I'm not defending Murray's view of what the social policy should be. I'm open-minded about universal basic income. I think there can be a good faith debate about many of these topics. It's a completely separate conversation. And I totally share your concern about racism and inequality. And again, I have no interest in using science to establish differences between races. But the problem is, and, and I have publicly criticized people who do have an interest in using science that way. And one of my critical questions of Murray was, why pay attention to any of this stuff? And I have said publicly that I didn't think his answer was great on that. And I'm not interested in paying attention to this stuff, and yet I have to in order to, to have conversations like this. But the problem is that the data on population differences will continue to emerge whether we're looking for it or not. And the idea that one should lie about these data or pretend to be convinced by bad arguments that are politically correct, or worse, that it's okay to malign people or even destroy their reputations if they won't pretend to be convinced by bad arguments, that's a disaster. Morally and politically and intellectually, that is a disaster. And that's where we are, right? That's my criticism of what you have done at Vox and what Turkheimer and Nisbet and Hardin have done. And the truth is, for whatever reason, okay, however noble it is in your head, you've been extraordinarily unfair to me and Murray, okay, and, and especially to Murray. To, I just want to give you a couple of examples here. I think we have to go into this issue of, you know, you just claimed you didn't call us racist, right? You didn't use the word racist. I'll grant you that. You use the word racialist, right, which you know most people will read as racist. But even if, you, even if that is an adequate way to split the difference, everything else you said imputed, if not an utter racial bias and a commitment to some kind of white superiority, you say again and again that, I mean, here's, here's a quote from your article. This is actually the subtitle of the article. And when I, you know, I called the podcast with Murray Forbidden Knowledge. You said it isn't forbidden knowledge. It's America's most ancient justification for bigotry and racial inequality, right? We're shilling for bigotry and racial inequality. And then you convict Murray, again, this is a quote, of, of, of being engaged in a decades-long focus on the intellectual inferiority of African Americans. Now, honestly, that is a smear. I mean, Murray has not been focused on African Americans. He's been waging a decades-long battle to survive being scapegoated by people who insinuate that he's a racist. And the nature of that battle is to continually try to, you have to keep touching this issue to get the slime off of you. But as you know, the bell curve was not focused on race. There's just one chapter on race. And the truth is that, and you, you almost alluded to this in what you just said, the truth is that Murray is just as worried about unearned privilege as you are. He's just worried about a different kind of privilege. You could call it IQ privilege, right? And the bell curve is a, an 800-page lament on this type of privilege. And it, again, it has nothing in principle to do with race. Murray is just as worried about the, the white people on the left side of the IQ distribution as black people or Latinos or anyone else. And you could have said it would be just as true to describe him as having been involved in a decades-long focus on the superiority of Asians over white people, okay? Because that's also part of the story. And, you know, you, you might ask yourself why you didn't do that. But I want to read a quote from Murray 
on my podcast because this, I mean, this is, again, if you, I, I'm not at all arguing for his social policies. I just want us to be fair to the man. And so this is a quote. If there's one thing that writing the bell curve did, it sensitized me to the extent to which high IQ is pure luck. Okay, none of us earn our IQ, whether it's by nature or nurture. We aren't the ones who did the nurturing. Hard work and perseverance and all those other qualities are great, but we can't take credit for our IQ. We live in a society that is tailor-made for people with high IQs. The people who got the short end of the stick in that lottery deserve our admiration and our support if they're doing everything right. And that's the end of the quote. He is worried about a world where success is determined by a narrow range of abilities. And these abilities, whether they come from nature or nurture, are distributed unequally. That's guaranteed to be true. We just know that they can't possibly be equal, both among individuals and across groups. And when you're talking about the averages in groups. And he's totally committed, as I am, Again, I don't know how many times you have to reiterate this in a podcast to make it stick, but the punchline here is that everyone has to be treated as an individual, that we have to get past thinking about groups. I mean, there's more variance within a group than between groups, and everyone has to be encountered on their own merits. And he's totally clear about that. So to paint him as callous and as racist, and as essentially a white supremacist, you're talking, he's, he's fixated on the inferiority of blacks on your account. It is irresponsible and unethical. And that, that's the, the kind of wrong that I was trying to address by giving him a platform on my podcast. And that is what produced so much outrage in me in our email exchange. When I hear this, I actually really wonder how much, I want to be careful here. I know Charles Murray. Um, when I wrote my very first piece as a journalist in Washington, it was a piece about poverty. I interviewed him for it. Um, I've reviewed his books. I've talked with him. Um, my wife is writing a book about UBI, actually. He's quoted in the book. I do not want Charles Murray silenced. And he's a lovely guy interpersonally. There's no doubt about that. And the quote you read from him about luck, I want to put a pin in that because there's a whole conversation I want to have with you about that quote. If Charles Murray followed what that quote implies, I think things would look very different with him and, and with my view of his career. But I do think I, I need to go through some of what you said here. So first, I don't know how much you understand Charles Murray's career. As I said, his first book is Losing Ground. It's a book about the Great Society. In the interest of time and, and basic human sanity here, Ezra, no, I'm, I'm, I'm worried I, that what you're going to do is actually, is, all the stuff you're going to cover is actually irrelevant because one... Hey, Sam, I've let you, I've let you had your say. I'm going to I'm just going to I'm just going to keep going. OK, that's fine. But I just want to prevent your and listener frustration here, because if you go on for 10 minutes for me to only say, well, again, his social policies are not social policies I am advocating. We're going to don't worry, we're going to go we're going to go through all this. And um, I <laughs> I don't mean this to be sharp, but you don't give short answers yourself. So, you know, we're just going to have to indulge the other one here. Sure. So, OK, so his first book is Losing Ground. It's about dissolving the welfare state. And again, he says in the, about that book, a lot of whites think they're racist. I'm going to show them they're not. Next book is The Bell Curve. The way Murray often defends The Bell Curve is by saying, hey, look, it only had this one chapter on race and IQ. And he's completely, or actually a couple chapters, but he's completely right about that. The chapters where that is mentioned, they are not the bulk of the book. But I'm actually a publisher of pieces. And I work with a lot of authors on book excerpts. The furor around The Bell Curve is not around the book, which it's a long book. Most people haven't read it. It's that the part of the book that he had excerpted on the New Republic, on the cover of the New Republic under Andrew Sullivan, the cover of the New Republic, it just says in big letters, race and IQ. The reason that is the part people focus on is that they pulled the most controversial part of the book and made it a huge deal. I know that authors, when they don't want their most controversial part to, become, to define the work, they don't let you excerpt that. So, so one, I don't think Murray's blame is there. His next book is honestly weirder. I don't know if you've ever read or, or even that, are that familiar with human achievement. I mean, just to book. be on the record here, I've read The Bell Curve and I've read Coming Apart. And that's all. That's all and, and, and Coming Apart's an interesting book, too. And Coming Apart is, just spells out his concern about the cognitive stratification of society. So Human Achievement is a book where Murray, and this is, comes right after The Bell Curve. And when I describe this book, I almost feel like people, people are not going to believe me. But, but go look it up. Murray wants to quantify the human achievements of different races. And the way he does that 
is he looks in a bunch of encyclopedias and he literally counts up the amount of space given to the accomplishments of artists and philosophers and scientists from, from, from different places. And he uses that to say European Amer Europeans, white Europeans, have done the most to push forward human achievement. Um, one criticism that I and other people have of Murray is that he often looks at indicators that reflect inequality and uses them to justify inequality. That, that book is like one of the most massive correlation causation errors I, I can possibly imagine. So, so now the next thing you say is that um, in doing this, that I am conflating two things. I'm conflating just a calm discussion you two had about the science with a social policy agenda. I want to read you actually what was said in your discussion with Murray about this, because this is actually why I am interested in it. When you were talking with Murray, one thing I think to your credit is you repeatedly asked him, hey, why do this at all? Why have this whole discussion about race and IQ? What are, what are we doing here? So you say, why seek data on racial differences at all? What is the purpose of doing this? And Murray responds, and again, I'm quoting, because we now have social policy embedded in employment policy, in academic policy, which is based on the premise that everybody's equal above the neck, whether it is men or women or whether it is ethnicity. And when you have that embedded into law, you have a variety of bad things happen. And then you ask it again. You say, needless to say, I'm sure we can find hate supremacist organizations who love the fact that the bell curve was published and admonish their members to read it at the first opportunity. Why look at this? How does this help society give more information about racial difference? And Murray, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing because I think that would be dull, gives a long answer about affirmative action and why it is bad. So I am not the one conflating this, number one. I am listening to the conversation you had. I'm listening. I, I'm a close reader of Murray's work. And the reason I care about this stuff is because I care about what the actual social policy outcomes Ezra, are. Ezra, then you the don't know thing, what I mean by conflate. Let me just say, I, I got to clarify this. Sam, this is confusion. You can, you can respond just... to everything when I'm done. I promise I will shut up and let you talk. The final thing that you did um, in your answer to me here was you said again and again, people pretending to believe politically correct ideas, people pretending to believe that evidence. A, a couple things on that. I don't doubt your sincerity in this, but I can assure you that Nisbet and Paige Hardin and Eric Turkheimer and me, we actually believe what we believe. And, and one of the things that has honestly been frustrating to me in dealing with you is you have a kind of a very sensitive ear to where you feel that somebody has uh, insulted you, but not a sensitive ear to yourself. During this discussion, you have called me, and not through implication, not through something where you're reading in between the lines, you've called me a slanderer, a liar, intellectually dishonest, a bad faith actor, cynically motivated by profit, defamatory, libelous. Um, you've called uh, Turkheimer and, and Nisbet and, and Paige Harding, you've called them fringe. You've said just here that they're part of a politically correct moral panic. I, I do think that you need to do a little bit more here to credit the idea that there just is a disagreement here. And it's a disagreement in part because people are looking at different parts of this with different emphasis, but also disagreement because people look at this issue and see different things. I, I often hear you on your podcast talk about how it's important to try to, to, try to extend the idea of sincerity. And, and one thing that is annoying is that, you know, um, among the one thing that one thing that I've not done is assume that you don't believe what you believe. Everybody here is trying to have an argument about something that is important, that in Murray's words is about how we end up, that, ref, that should feed into how we order society, what we do to redress racial difference. And that's not just a high stakes conversation. It's also one where people just disagree. Okay. So untangling a bit of confusion here. I guess there's two topics here that I should address. I think we have to talk about what it means to insinuate that someone's racist, but the conflation issue. I get that you hate his social policies. I get that you see that he thinks his social policies are justified by what he thinks is empirically true in the world of data and facts and human difference. So there's a connection there, right? And you're worried that if one takes the data seriously in the way that he takes it seriously, if one endorses his interpretation of the data from psychology or psychometrics or behavioral genetics, that that will lead to social policies that you find abhorrent or that you think will produce a massive amount of inequality or suffering or something wrong. And I get that. But the conflation is, is that talking about data is one thing. 
talking about what should be done in light of the facts that you acknowledge to be true or are likely to be true is another. And there can be good faith disagreements in both of those conversations. Those conversations are not inextricably linked. And what I am noticing here is, and what I've called a moral panic, is that there are people who think that if we don't make certain ideas, certain facts taboo to discuss, if we don't impose a massive reputational cost in discussing these things, then terrible things will happen at the level of social policy. That the only way to protect our politics is to be, again, this is a loaded term, but this is what is happening from my view scientifically, is to be intellectually dishonest, to be led by confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is a real thing, and this is the situation I think we're in. Everything you've said about the politics and the historical wrongs of racism, which you wrote about a lot in your last piece, I totally agree with, okay? And I'm probably more aligned with you politically than I am with Murray, which is to say that I share your biases. I share the bias that is leading you to frame the matter the way you're framing it. Again, I probably should have spelled this out in the beginning of my podcast with Murray, and I didn't for reasons I described. I don't think it would have made a bit of difference, but I, I still should have done it. And I think it would have been called anodyne the way that Nisbet et al. called are talking about individual differences, anodyne. But I think everything you say about the history of racism is true. I think you could well be on the right side of a good debate about social policy. And your concerns here are totally understandable. I get all of that. So this goes to the charge of bad faith against you, which in this conversation, I admitted, might have been unfair, right? You might not be the Glenn Greenwald character I read you to be at a certain point in that email exchange. So let's just assume, as you say, that you feel intellectually scrupulous and ethically righteous, okay? I know what it's like to feel that. And you feel this way because you are concerned about racism, you're horrified by the history of racism, and you feel that the kinds of social policies that Murray favors would be disastrous. And again, I'm not arguing for those social policies. But your bias here, your connection to the political outcomes when you're talking about the empirical science is causing you to make journalistic errors. It's causing Nisbet and Turkheimer to make errors of scientific reasoning. And these are obvious errors. I mean, in your last piece, you have this whole section on the Flynn effect and how the Flynn effect should be read as accounting for the black-white differences in purely environmental terms. Well, even Flynn rejects that interpretation of, of the Flynn effect. I mean, he had originally hoped, he publicly hoped that his effect would account for that, but now he has acknowledged that the, the data don't suggest that. And there are many other errors of this kind that you and Nisbet and Turkheimer are making when you criticize me and Murray. And you criticize Murray for errors that he didn't make. And in order for you to imagine that I'm equally biased, right? Because you must imagine bias on my side. Why am I getting it so wrong, right? Why am I looking at the same facts that Nisbet and Turkheimer and Harden are looking at, and I am getting it absolutely wrong? You have to imagine that I have an equal and opposite passion, that I feel equally righteous, but it's pointing in the opposite direction. I would have to be a grand dragon of the KKK to feel an equal and opposite bias on these data. And you've already said you don't think I'm a racist, but that's what it would be, have to be true of me to be as biased as you are, again, understandably, given the history of racism on these data. And it's just not the case. What you have in me is someone who shares most of your political concerns and yet is unwilling to, again, a loaded word, lie about what is and is not a good reading of empirical data and what is and is not a good argument about genetics and environment and, the and, and what is reasonable to presume based on what we already know. And again, the problem is, is that even if we never look for these things again, even if we follow this taboo and decide that it's just there's no ethical reason to ever look at population differences, we will be continually ambushed by these data. They're just going to spring out of our study of intelligence generically or human genetics generically. 
has happened on other topics already, and people try to keep quiet about it because, again, the environment journalistically and politically is so charged. And my criticism of you has been from day one that you are contributing to that political charge, and it's totally unnecessary because the political answer is so clear. The political answer is we have to be committed to racial equality and everyone getting all the opportunities in life for happiness and self-actualization that they can use. And we're nowhere near achieving that kind of society. And the real racists are the people who are not committed to those goals. <laughs> There's so much there. Uh, I actually really appreciate that answer because I think it, I think it helps um, open this up. So let me say a couple things here. One is that one of my macro, one of the things I've come to, to think about you that I actually did not come into this believing is you're very quick to see a lot of psychological tendencies, cognitive fallacies, et cetera, in others that you don't see applying to yourself or people you've sort of written into your tribe. So you say words in, in there like confirmation bias, et cetera, to me about Murray, about how we're looking at Murray. And my whole, the whole thing I just told you is that Charles Murray is a guy who works at conservative think tanks, whose first book was about how to get, why we should get rid of the welfare state, who is, his whole life's work is about breaking down social policy. So to the extent that I have any biases that flow backwards from political commitments, so does he. We're, we're all- but What's my bias? Just, so we're, I'm going to go through that. Don't worry. I promise you I will get to your bias very quickly. Um, I do want to note, you, you mentioned James Flynn here. Uh, to prepare for this conversation, I called um, Flynn the other day. I spoke to him on um, Monday. Uh, his read of the evidence right now, and this is me quoting him, he says, I think it is more probable than not that the IQ difference between black and white Americans is environmental. As a social scientist, I cannot be sure if they have a genetic advantage or disadvantage. So I'm just, that is what James Flynn thinks as of Monday. So then you ask me, and, and I think this is a great, this is a good question, because I think this gets to, to the core of this, and it gets to where I tried to open us up into. You, your view of this debate is that to say that you have a bias in it is to say in your terms that you're, you're like the grand dragon of the KKK, that the only version of a bias that could be influencing what you see here is a core form of racism. That's actually not my view of you, but I do think you, I do think you have a bias. I think you have a huge um, sensitivity, let's put it that way, and you have a lot of difficulty extending an assumption of good faith to anyone who disagrees with you on an issue that you code as identity politics. Um, and there's a place actually where I think you got into this in a, in a pretty interesting way. Um, I went back and I read your discussion with Glenn Lowry. At the beginning, when you're talking about why you chose to have Glenn on the show, you say, my goal was to find an African-American intellectual who could really get into the details with me, but whom I also trusted to have a truly rational conversation that wouldn't be contaminated by identity politics. To, to you, engaging in identity politics discredits your ability to participate in a, in a rational conversation. And it's something, as far as I can tell, that you, you do not see yourself as doing. So, so here's my question for you uh, on that specific quote. What does it mean to you, particularly when you're talking about something like race, to have your ideas contaminated by identity politics? What I mean by identity politics is that you are reasoning on the basis of you know, skin color or religion or gender or some particular trait which you have by accident. You fell into that bin through no process of reasoning on your own. You convinced to be white or black. And to reason from that place as though because you're you, because you have the skin color you have, certain things are true and very likely incommunicable to other people who don't share your identity. But, you know, I view this as the, like, the most unhappy game of Dungeons and Dragons ever. People have these various stories of victimology that if you do the arithmetic one way, one group trumps another, another way it, it gets reversed. And this strikes me as a moral and political and intellectual dead end, because the things that are really true, the things that will really move the dial with respect to human well-being. And again, my career, I view my career as being totally committed to amplifying good ideas and 
criticizing bad ideas insofar as they relate to the most important swings of human well-being. So my concern is, how can the future be better than the past? How can we get to a world where we cancel the worst effects of bad luck, given that some people are hugely lucky and some people aren't? How can we cancel this with respect to wealth and health and everything else? And how can we get to a world where the maximum number of people thrive? I view identity politics as among the worst pieces of software you can be running to try to get there. I want to get to a world where, you know, it's Martin Luther King's claim about the content of your character rather than the color of your skin, right? I, that is the goal. And if you want to reverse engineer that goal, giving primacy to identity is one of the worst things you can do. That's how I would frame it. So that's super helpful for me. Here's my criticism of you now. I don't think you realize that the identity politics software is operating in you all of the time. And I think it's strong. So when you, when you look at literature on the, uh, the conversation about race in America, you often see the discussion broken into racists and anti-racists. That's something that, that, that you'll read often in this debate. I think there's something else, particularly lately, which you might call anti-anti-racism, which is folks who are fundamentally more concerned or fundamentally primarily concerned with the overreach of what you would call the anti-racists. And actually, that's where I think you are. And one of the things that, that, that I hear in you is that whenever something gets near the question of, of political correctness, the, the canary in the coal mine for the way you yourself have been treated, you get very, very, very strident. They're in bad faith. They're not being able to speak rationally. They're not being able to have a conversation that is actually um, going forward on a sound evidentiary basis. And the thing that I, I don't think that you're self-reflective enough about, um, and, and, and I apologize, because I, I, know, I know that I statements are better than you statements, but I do want to push this idea at you to, for, you to, for you to think about it, is that there are things that are threats to you. There are things that are threats to your tribe, to your future, to your career. And those threats are very salient. So you see what happened to Charles Murray, the kind of criticism he gets. And that sets off every alarm bell in your head. And, and you, you bring them on the show and you're like, we're, we're, we're going to fix this. I'm going to show that they can't do this to you. And you look around and you say, Ezra, you think we shouldn't take away all social, all efforts to redress racial inequality. But that's a bias. You're, you're, you're just, you know, you're just being led around by, by your political opinions where I am standing outside the debate acting rationally. And to me, that's actually not what's happening at all. I think that you're not here. I, I think you're missing a lot because you are very radically increasing the salience of things that threaten your identity, your tribe, without, which is not the craziest thing to do in the world. It's not a terrible thing to do. We all do it without admitting or maybe even without realizing that's what you're doing. I think that there is a lot of discussion like this in the public sphere just generally at the moment. There are a lot of white commentators, of which I am also one, who look at what's happening on some campuses or look at what happens on, on Twitter mobs or whatever, and they see a threat to them. And the concern about political correctness goes way, 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 way up. And then the ability to hear what the folks who are, are making the arguments actually say dissolves. The ability to hear what the so-called social justice warriors are actually worried about dissolves. And, and I think that's a really big blind spot here. I think it's making it hard for you to see when people have good faith disagreement with you. And I also think it's making it harder for you to see how to weight some of the different concerns that are operating in this conversation. You're, you're so concerned about Murray and what has happened to him when, again, he's an extremely successful that's scholar actually in confusion. Washington. That, that's a point when, of confusion. When that you're not, I mean, in your whole show, Sam, you've had 120 some episodes. And if I and I could have miscounted this, I, I totally take that as a possibility here. It's amazing you, you would two, think this is relevant, but yes, give, give me the numbers. I think you've had two African Americans as guests. I think you need to explore the experience of race in America more, and not just see, see that as identity politics. See that as information that is important to talking about some of the things you want to talk about, but also to hearing from some of the people who you've now written out of the conversation to hear. This is the kind of thing that I would be tempted to score as bad faith. I'm shocked. <laughs> in someone else. But actually, I think this is a point of confusion, but it is nonetheless confusion here. So your accusation that I'm reasoning on the basis of my tribe here is just false. This is the whole game I play. 
this is my main focus in constructing my worldview and having conversations with other people. When I'm thinking about things that are true, that stand a chance of being universal, that stand a chance of scaling, these are the kinds of things that are not subordinate to a person's identity. They're not the things that will be true by accident of birth because you happen to have been born in India and are Hindu. I mean, this is the problem I have with religious sectarianism. This is the problem I have with nationalism or any other kind of tribalism that can't possibly scale to a global civilization that's truly cosmopolitan, where when you're reasoning among strangers, you have to converge on solutions to problems that work independent of who you happen to be. I mean, this is why, you know, John Rawls's veil of ignorance thought experiment was so brilliant. To d design a, a just society, a great heuristic is to think of the society you would want not knowing who you're going to be in it. That's the perfect nullification of the logic of identity politics. You have to figure out what would be good for everyone before you realize what the color of your skin is. And the reason why I'm defending Murray to the degree that I have been is not because I have this incredible sympathy with him because he's a white guy like me. I defend Muslim reformers who are not white and ex-Muslims who are not white. I've, I've spent way more time defending Ayan Hirsi Ali than Charles Murray. And she's the victim of the same kind of leftist stupidity, frankly. Her demonization has the exact same structure that Murray's does. And I have spent an enormous investment of time and money, frankly, defending Ion. So your charge is false with respect to my motivations. And there's something here, there's so many layers of confusion here. I mean, this is just, and again, it's not just yours, it's everybody. So it's got to be a majority of both our audiences. But I want to say something about this notion of what's at stake here, because you, in your recent piece, you talk about I mean, Murray's focus on the inferiority of blacks. Intellectual inferiority. Yeah, but you also use just inferiority of blacks are inferior as well. Go back, go back and look at the piece. But this notion of inferiority, I mean, no one talks about inferiority who's actually having a dispassionate argument on this topic of, of IQ testing. And it's, it absolutely does not map on, I, mean, I, I can only, I'm not going to pretend to be a mind reader, but it certainly doesn't map onto my view of this situation. I mean, for instance, I would bet my life that my IQ is lower than John von Neumann's was. The chances of that being true are 100%. Right? Now, of course, this is mere speculation, but this is speculation that you could bet the fate of the world on. So despite what Turkheimer says in his article and his tweets, you can make very high probability speculations. So do you think I'm inferior to John von Neumann? Do you think I think I'm inferior to John von Neumann. So two things here. So one, when I talk about what Murray says specifically, I do use intellectual inferiority. I got the piece out in front of me. I do think 100% without doubt that when we have in American life over and over and over again said that African Americans are intellectually less capable than whites, that has been, yes, that is a way of saying that they are inferior. And it has been a way of treating them as if they are inferior. It has been a way of justifying social outcomes that are unbelievably unequal and unfair that have been going on until, I mean, they're going on in the present day. You know, something that, that you said in here, Sam, I think is important because one, I, I actually, while you called it confusion, I, I don't, I still am not clear on which part is actually confused. What, what I would argue about this is recognizing that there are folks who it is easier for us to hear from and, and, and harder is part of gathering the information about the world for us to understand what is true. So w during our email exchange, let me use this as an example. You wrote to me, again, quoting here, if James Flynn is right, if Flynn is right, then the mean IQs of African-American children who are second and third generation upper middle class should have converged with those of the children of upper middle class whites. But as far as I understand, they haven't. I think that sentence right there, that is not having an enough experience or having thought hard enough or dug into the literature. I mean, there are different ways of learning about the world, of course, but about people whose experience is different than yours. I mean, I'll give one example here that I actually said to you in these emails. Um, African-American families making $100,000 a year tend to live in neighborhoods with the same income composition as white families making $30,000 a year. 
So to say that you have an African-American family that is middle class or upper middle class and that their experiences now is so similar to that of whites that somehow the environmental um, atmosphere around them has equalized. I, I, I think that is something that is being missed and that the, Ezra, the, way, Ezra, you, the, way, missed, you, the way you level, I'll just finish on this point. The way you leverage identity politics here is a way of not forcing yourself to see some of that. Okay, but this is something you've done by implication more or less every time you've touched this topic. You've suggested that Murray is trying to establish that the differences between the mean IQs in various groups are genetic. He's not. He's simply suggested that there's good reason to believe that genes and environment both play a part. That is a safe assumption for basically everything we care about physically and mentally. Right? That is as safe an assumption in behavioral genetics as can be made. And this is an assumption that Turkheimer and Nisbet don't want to make for patently political reasons, I would argue. But I can't tell you, every single scientist I spoke to before I did my podcast with Murray, who's close to these data, scientists who don't want to publicly defend him because they don't want to have to have conversations like this, agreed that what had been done to him was absolutely disgraceful and that his reading of the science is fine, right? And Richard Hare, who came to our defense, again, unbidden, put his reputation on the line to argue for that. My experience as a person who was getting ready to have a conversation with Murray, wondering whether or not he should do it, wondering whether or not this is just, you know, maybe this guy is a racist who's distorted the science. My experience was of encountering scientists who were basically in hiding on this topic, scientists whose names would be well known to you, right, people who have stellar reputations, but who don't want to go near this for all the trouble it causes them. Just to give you another sense of the, of the, of the picture, of, of the context in which we're having this conversation, your Vox article, the original Vox article, landed on the Hate Watch page at the Southern Poverty Law Center website in the stream that talks about neo-Nazi hate groups and the Atlanta bomber, right, there's me and Murray. That's not an accident. That's not a gratuitous misreading of the article. That is the taboo I'm talking about. We are now purveyors of hate. Let's take this off of race and IQ for a second. This is something that would have been probably just as radioactive, and it just happened to break the other way, and sort of nobody noticed. But you probably recall, I think it was three years ago, I think it was, or four years ago, I think it was 2014, where there were reports about Neanderthal DNA. And it was learned that it's actually, I think it's David Reich, whose op-ed in the New York Times kind of kicked off our latest skirmish. I think it's based on his work. It was found that most human beings are walking around with two, around 2.7% Neanderthal DNA. But it was found that the only people who don't have Neanderthal DNA are black people, right? People who directly descend with some isolation from Africa, from the rest of the human community. And so at the time, I tweeted, right, this is now 2014, I tweeted, attention all racists. You are right. Whites are special. We're part Neanderthal. Blacks are just human. Okay, and it just was a, you know, a trolling of the world's racist, right? Now, the fact that I tweeted that should give you, give you as a journalist some indication of, of what I think about white supremacy. But what if the data had broken the other way? Okay, what if the only people on Earth who were part Neanderthal were black? Okay, what then? What, what would have happened? To anyone who reported those data, what would it, I mean? Would that have been an example of trafficking in the most deeply harmful tropes? I mean, it was just pure good luck it broke the other way, and yet this is the kind of thing that will keep coming at us. And this is this is the problem that you appear to be unprepared for, and it's it's the problem that you, in the face of which, you appear to be willing to believe people who are who are not speaking with real integrity about data because it serves political ends. And you appear to be willing to help destroy people's reputations who take the other side of these conversations. And the problem is this. We know that we will discover things about populations that can appear invidious and appear politically inconvenient. 
and we don't know when we will discover them. We know that there is enough variation, both genetically and environmentally, that if we looked at differences among the Inuit and the Koreans and the people from Latin America, we're going to find differences. And again, these differences don't always make white people look good. The Asian IQ data is the reverse of the black-white difference thus far, psychometrically. And no one is worried about Asian privilege, right? I mean, we got Asians suing Harvard University today because they're being excluded from Harvard. And that's the other side of these, this affirmative action question. And we have to figure out some way to solve this. And the political response, the basic political response, I mean, the policy response is open to good faith debate. But the basic one has to be not identity politics, but a commitment to basic fairness for all individuals, no matter what nominal group they seem to be a part of. Because again, these groups are poorly defined. Most of these groups are defined based on people's self-identification. You could find out on genetic analysis that they, they, don't, they don't even come from where they thought they came from, right? But however you define a group, you will find differences. And to, to treat those differences as, in principle, radioactive, that is just a, it is a bad strategy going forward. It will produce political harm. It will produce intellectual harm. And it is what explains the fact that I have people, or reputable scientists in my inbox, who have totally taken my side in this, but who are too afraid to say so publicly. And the reason why they should be afraid is proven by the fact that I'm now on the Southern Poverty Law Center website as a hate monger. So a couple things here. So one, I want to go back to something you say in here about, I just want to call out that you keep doing this thing where you say, ah, oh, there are all these people who disagree with me and they disagree with me because they're not willing to read the data with integrity. I am not telling you, you're not reading the data with integrity. You keep telling others that. And, and I, and I, and I told, think you call that, me a pseudoscientist and a junk scientist over well, and over I think, again. I think the, the, the scientists called the Nisbet and, and Paige Harden and Turkheimer said that they believe Murray's interpretation of this ultimately is pseudoscience and way is way, way, way out front of the data. In fact, by the way, the Reich piece. You the know, Reich Turkheimer piece, has apologized for that. What do you do Turkheimer with the fact said that, he, that Turkheimer has said apologized for that. that he that he holds all the, I spoke with him yesterday. He holds all the same views on this, but he feels that that wasn't helpful to the debate, which is nice of him. He maybe you know, it's good to keep the debate's temperature down, but that doesn't change his view. OK, but if it's not if it's not junk science, then it's a disagreement about the actual science. I think the term <laughs> I think you're going to have to ask Turkheimer what he thinks on this. I think you're I think you're misreading him at any rate. Um, I, I, I think it would be not useful for us to, to, to spend our time on that. They, David Reich, in the very article that you sent to me, his view on this is that whatever we think now is going to be proven wrong, that whatever confidence we have now is going to be shown to be incorrect, that the, 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 the ideas and the information coming down the pike are going to surprise us. So the argument of Turkheimer, Paige Harden, Nisbet in the piece that, that in, again, people should go to the show notes and read these pieces, is that who knows, maybe sometime in the future we'll find this, but right now there is no reason to believe it. Now, one thing you said that that I say, one, I don't know what I don't know what it is in this case. That that it is that the that there is a negative IQ difference that is in part genetic for African Americans. That is that is the it. Now, one thing that you say I say is that I keep saying Murray calls this genetic. I, he does. He's pretty clear there's a genetic component. So are you in the piece? I can I can quote it back. But it's completely true that he's he says I don't know what the uh, numbers are. What is interesting about the move Murray makes. And this is the thing that I call out in my piece and, and have talked about a bit, is that what Murray is intent on showing, is it genetic or environmental? It's uh, it, it can't be changed. It's immutable. He says, there is this notion, and this was in your podcast, there is this notion that if traits are genetically determined, that's bad. And if they're environmentally determined, that's good because we can do something about them if they're environmental. There's one lesson that we've learned from the last 70 years of social policy it is that changing environments in ways that produce measurable results is really, really hard. We actually don't know how to do it no matter how much money we spend. If you go read both the original and the second Vox pieces, they're primarily about this claim. They're primarily about the claim that we cannot change these outcomes. They're primarily about the claim that, you know what, if you move people into, say, the, the correct form into adoption into high income families, they have a 12 to 18 point IQ uh, change. There is tons and tons of evidence. Now we're getting into my world again in the realm of social policy of not just effects from social policy on one generation, 
but multi-generational effects from things like Medicaid and so on. And so one, one place where I think this is important is that a lot of the debate here and a lot of the reason people care about it is that if you're saying things are immutable, often people say they're immutable because they're genetic. Murray actually says they're immutable really no matter what. If you say they're immutable, that's actually a way, and, and this is what Murray does, again, explicitly and repeatedly, both on your show and in other places, is say that because they're immutable, that really means that this is not kind of on us. This is not on us, white America or America broadly. And we don't have to kind of feel so bad. We can embrace the politics of difference. We can begin removing some of these social supports, don't need to have as much affirmative action, don't need this employment non-discrimination stuff. We can cut the size of this social welfare state. He wants to do things that stop pushing people up as much. And then, of course, and this is the way this has always gone in American history, then when people don't advance, folks will look at that and say, hey, look, they're, they're not advancing. They're not closing the gap quickly enough. That just goes to show the problem is innate. Now, this is something you brought up earlier when you brought up that quote from Murray about luck. And I think it's an important conversation. I think that if you follow Murrayism on this, if you, if you were doing it without the political commitments he brings to it, it actually takes you to a very radical and interesting place. If you say that our IQ is genetic and environmental, but at any rate, it's not our fault because we don't choose either one of those and there's not much we can do about it. And not just our IQ, but something you've said is that, you know, a lot of traits come down like this, the big five personality traits, determination. I mean, look, you can, you can, you can connect genetic inheritance to divorce, right? It's got a, I think it's a 0.2 or a 0.4 correlation. So if you begin to believe that, actually you begin to ask the question of, should, do we deserve what we have? Should society be vastly more redistributive than it actually is? Should we be much less uh, it, it, within this construct that what we're getting, we're getting because of hard work and determination and intelligence and, and, and the application of our talents? And in fact, we need to move to something that is, um, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not literally advocating this, but more in the range of full socialism. What I think is so interesting about the way he takes this debate, and I recognize this is not something somewhere you took the debate. I'm just, I, I do think this is a useful thing to talk about, is that if you really did believe things were immutable, if you really did believe that this was our inheritance, both environmental and genetic, and we can't do much about it, then I think the implications of that are radical. And the implications aren't that you take away help from people. It's that you say pretty much what all of us has is primarily illegitimate. We didn't do anything to earn it. Uh, I just happened to be born with, you know, the collection of talents that got me where I am. And as such, what we should spread around in society is much more vast. Funnily enough, I don't ever see people take that attitude on this. Again, the history of these ideas in America is they tend to be used to justify the status quo, not um, radically more generous versions of the status quo. But but I do think that's interesting. And I, I don't understand why people don't take that leap. I, I, I think that the implication of this is it's luck. And if you if you want to believe that, and again, I don't believe they're immutable. I don't think that's what the evidence shows. But if you do believe they're luck, I don't think it takes you where he went in your conversation. OK, well, there is some more confusion here. Uh, I'm sorry, but your representation of the state of the science is very Nisbetian and that's not an accident. And then one wonders why you wouldn't publish the other side of a good faith scientific debate, especially when you have someone like me complaining about the harms reputationally that come when, with publishing only one side of it. Do you want a quick answer on why we didn't publish higher? Sure. So when you so during this and, and people heard your uh, explanation at the beginning, but we published a Vox piece. The Vox authors were getting a lot of criticism from, from you and others, which is, you know, it's reasonable to debate. During this, you were emailing me and you'd publicly challenge me to a debate. If you had emailed me, number one, nobody, no, there's no guaranteed response from somebody's handpicked expert. And I mean, that's not how the New York Times op-ed page works or the Washington Post or anything, but it's a reasonable ask to make. If you had come to me and you had said, hey, look, I don't think this piece was fair to me. Um, I think, you know, this guy higher wants to write something. Let's, let's take a look at it. I might have been open to that. But what you did was you came to me and you said, let's debate. And I had agreed to do it. And not only that, I'd agreed to release the debate to Vox. So people were going to hear you defend your position. Now you are backing off of that and demanding instead that I publish a handpicked expert. And that's just not the way this works. It wasn't handpicked. This guy came out of the blue. I didn't even know who he was well, at that point. So it was... Well, somebody you preferred who, who had your views. I thought that I was giving you the, the opportunity to respond that you wanted. And now you were privately trying to pull that back and do something different. 
And that to me was just actually bad faith. Okay. Um, well, what, what you should understand. So for the record. Okay. Well, what you should understand, and I've, I've said this many times, is that the opportunity to respond is no opportunity at all. I mean, it's, it's the opportunity to continually to be slimed by association with these seemingly radioactive ideas. It's the opportunity to seem to care about racial difference, even though you don't, just in an effort to prove you were not guilty of a racially biased misreading of the empirical data. It's not an opportunity that I want. It's not an opportunity that, uh, that I'm happy to take in this conversation because merely talking about, again, I would just take it back to something as superficial as the Neanderthal data, right? Had that broken the other way and the factual claim to make is that black people are part Neanderthal and white people aren't, it's the opposite. But if had it gone the other way, you look like a racist asshole even paying attention to that. There's just no way to talk about it, given all of the associations with race and Neanderthals and all the rest. And what I'm saying is that we have to grow up. We have to treat our, our audiences like adults, not like dangerous children who will plunge into some toxic politics if you talk about the science in a disinterested and dispassionate way. And we have to stop sliming people with the worst motives when they find themselves in the possession of these kinds of facts, or even when they argue for social policies that you don't agree with. Now, again, I'm not defending Murray's social policies. I don't happen to agree with socialism because I think it's just, it doesn't interface with human selfishness in the right way so as to leverage hu human energy in the right way so as to produce good societies. I think we know that socialism doesn't work, but I am very sympathetic with some engineering of a tide that lifts all boats. And I don't know if that's universal basic income or some other way to redistribute much more than we do. And as we get into a world of more and more abundance, I think that has to be the solution. And I've written a lot about wealth inequality, and I've, I've worried about wealth inequality. You can Google up. I think my first article on the topic is titled How Rich is Too Rich. And you can go down the rabbit hole after that. But this is, a, this is something that I spent some time on. And if you know my views on free will, you'll know that I think it's all luck, even if these things about us are changeable. And I don't agree that, I mean, the, the problem is, yes, it's hard to change your IQ. We don't know of an environmental intervention that reliably changes people's IQ. And Murray's right about that. I'm not saying that we know that the differences between various groups in IQ is all genetic or even mostly genetic, but it's certainly prudent to assume that genes are involved for basically every difference we're going to find. And that is a, an argument that I could have with Turkheimer. It's a losing argument because everybody thinks this is toxic to even talk about, but I don't think Turkheimer is being honest about the science there. And there is no scientist I've spoken with in a sidebar conversation who thinks he's being honest with the science there. And again, these are names that would be well known to you, but who don't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole. Sam, you, you said already in this, in, in this answer that, um, you know, the thing you can't do in this discussion is slime people's motivations. I would say, and, and again, I really urge people to go read these pieces. Nobody tried to slime your motivations. They said you were wrong. And they actually said, you know, this is really wrong. It, it's dangerous. No, no, you you it's, said our conversation was of a piece with the worst crimes, uh, social crimes in American history. I said, and I, I will say, and I, the, on, you, the onus was on us to prove we're not Nazis. I mean, that was the implication of what Turkheimer wrote. Can I ask? Well, I didn't say about, nobody ever said Nazis, but let me no, ask you No, they didn't use the word Nazi. Yes. I'll, I'll throw this one back to you. Something you brought up a couple of times is something I wrote in my piece, and I am actually very happy to talk about this. I say that the belief that African-Americans are genetically less intelligent than whites and then also inferior in, other, uh, inferior in other ways, which I'm not saying you guys said, is our oldest and most ancient justification for racial inequality and bigotry. Do you disagree with that? When you look at American history, when you look at what we said at the dawn of this country and all the way through, all the way through the 1950s and 60s, when I say that, am I wrong? In a sense, you're wrong. I agree with the spirit of it. I mean, I think you could say the Bible is just as much of a justification, the notion that the race of Ham came under a curse and that these races were separately, have a separate theological stature. You had Bible-thumping racist maniacs defending slavery and without any reference to science. That's a, a great American tradition. 
I think tribalism is at the bottom of it and perceiving other people who look different and sound different from yourself as ineradicably different. I think that is a problem we must outgrow. And I fully agree with the social concerns that follow from noticing how far we have to go in outgrowing it. I think something here is that one of the things I detect in this conversation, this maybe gets to something we we discussed that we would talk about later, and it's maybe we've hit that point. I, I Something I detect here is the idea that, and I want to think about a phrase this carefully because I want to do it without making you defensive, is that ideas can only fit into this lineage if they are being said with racial animus, if they are being said by someone who doesn't like the people they're talking about. And I think an important thing when you study the history of racism in this country is that it has always had a scientific wrapper. It has always been not something people thought they were doing because they were hateful, something they thought they were doing because it was true. Because I, I quoted in my piece Thomas Jefferson, who Brilliant man, like a brilliant, genteel man, one of the one of the great. But a, a slaveholder, too. a slaveholder and not just a slaveholder, but a particularly vicious one. But one of the reasons I quoted him is that at the end of the bell curve. One thing Murray does is endorse the idea that uh, a correct understanding of stratified cognitive capacity, which operates racially and, and in other ways, should make us re-embrace what he calls a, t- a Jeffersonian politics of difference. He, he, he quotes Jefferson talking about how important it is to understand that, that people in society are fit for different uses, they're fit for different places. And I think now we look back at Jefferson and say, that's ridiculous, like the way you're talking about it. That is, it is grotesque. But when Jefferson was doing it, he, he felt himself being genteel when he was saying that, you know, African-Americans cannot compose thoughts above the level of plain narration. We now look at that and say the country that James Bal- that created James Baldwin, you think you think that? But, you know, Murray, and I'm not accusing him of holding Jefferson's views on race. He clearly doesn't. But he then, you know, in a very different way, comes out and says, look, like, we just need to accept that people are different, um, as Thomas Jefferson taught us. And do you, do you doubt that people are different? I mean, I just said that I'm not as smart as John von Neumann. Do you think maybe secretly I am as smart as John von Neumann? I doubt that we have, given the experiment we have run in this country, given the centuries of slavery and segregation and oppression, given locking people out of jobs, out of good schools, out of building wealth, out of going to into, into top professions, out of being part of the social networks that help you advance, the amount of violence and terror and trauma that we've inflicted on African Americans in this country, I absolutely doubt, I, I truly to the core of my being doubt, that we are at a place where any of us should have confidence saying that the differences we see in individuals now reflect intrinsic group capacity. I think that every other point that at every, but but no one, but even Murray wouldn't say that. That at every other point in American history where we have said that, that is exactly what Murray says, that at every other point in American history. There's again, there's confusion creeping in here. There's confusion here. I mean, you'll be able to. I'll I'll try to sort it out in my next follow. So that at every point in American history, we have made that argument. We now look back. And I mean, this is not going way back, right? Segregation. My mom was alive in segregation. Charles Murray was alive during segregation. Uh, we're talking, I think it's within the week of the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination. I mean, this is not ancient history. It is recent history. And I think we look back and we say, man, they really had it wrong. And and you quoted back at me something that I, I think it's either I say it or the Vox author say it. Now I don't remember. But that, yeah, if you're having a version of this conversation again, it is incumbent on you to say why you're so sure it will be different this time. And Murray does say, you know, he thinks that some combination of genetic and, and basically immutably environmental characteristics make it so we can't do much about this. And there just are big differences between the groups. And it's just going to remain that way. And American politics needs to rearrange itself around that reality. And yeah, I, I strongly disagree. And I disagree because of American history. And that is why my, my fundamental criticism of that conversation was that you needed to deal with more. You needed to deal more with the history of this conversation and the history of this country. But even in this conversation, you are unwilling to differentiate scientific fact and scientific data and reasonable extrapolations based on data from 
past injustices in American history. These are these are totally separate things. No, we disagree on what a reasonable extrapolation from the data is. What we can't disagree about is that the two sides of that conversation about scientific data appear to be given a very different moral treatment by you, right? So Turkheimer and Nisbet are well-respected scholars. Murray and I are people who need to be conjoined with this horrid history where our conversation is described as disastrous and dangerous and horrific and trafficking in the most harmful tropes, where we land on the hate speech page of, not even speech, just the hate page of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and where I have scientists who are effectively in hiding telling me we're right about the scientific conversation. That's, that is just the status quo here. I'm saying that's dysfunctional, and I'm saying it is unethical, right? That's one point. That is a completely separate problem from the problem of racism and the problem of racial inequality. And you feel that somehow this status quo problem of just how hard it is to talk about these things is justified because of how bad racial inequality has been in the past. I think and there I'm is what you would call it, confusion it's, it's, here. I, I do think it's just important to say this. I have not criticized you, and I continue to not, for having the conversation. I've criticized you for having the conversation without dealing with and, and, and separating it out and thinking through the context and the weight of American history on it, not the weight of American history, the weight of American history on the weight. The weight of American history is completely uh, no, irrelevant. It, it can't possibly to, be irrelevant on something it, that even you no, admit is environmental. Yes, but th that that part of the conversation has been had. You don't have to talk about slavery. You don't have to talk about the specific injustices in the past to have a conversation about the environmental factors that very likely keep people back. And I completely agree with you that it is right to worry that the environment for blacks or for any other group that seems not to be thriving by one metric or another, that the environment almost certainly plays a role. And the environment, we just know that the environment plays a role across the board in behavioral genetics. There's no one who's arguing that any of these traits, forget about intelligence, anything we care about is 100% heritable. It's just that nothing, complex is 100% heritable. And again, I have zero interest in establishing differences among races. And my reading of Murray, and he, again, he said this on my podcast several times, his focus is not on groups. His focus is on individuals. And it's just a fact that individuals find themselves with whatever cognitive toolkit they have, however they got it, based on genes and environment. And we have a society that is massively rewarding specific tools. No one on Murray's side of, of this debate is saying that all social self-worth is indexed by IQ scores. No one is saying that. And this is the point I was trying to make when I said, look, am, am I inferior to John von Neumann? I don't think so, and I don't think you think so, right? So what's at stake here is not a person's intrinsic worth. And using words like inferior completely loads the dice here. I mean, that, that is a highly charged moralistic assertion, which just does not map on to any sane person's thinking about this. Yes, it mapped on to Thomas Jefferson's thinking about this. But to summarize what I'm doing with the slaveholders of our distant past and talk about these things as though it's a single set of ideas, it's just completely unfair well, journalistically, let me, let me ask you and the it has on that. the consequence that I've described. Why? Let me, let me try to think about how to phrase this question. You say that it is unfair journalistically to put your conversation within the lineage of the conversation going all the way back in American history and all the way, as you say, pre-American history. In fact, in my piece, I, I quote Voltaire and Hume and others. That at each point, European <laughs> descended white men of scientific mind looked around them, looked at the society they saw, looked at the outcomes people had in the society they saw, looked at the science pulled from those outcomes, right? And it was called science back then too. And said, you know what? 
what we are seeing here is a result of innate differences between the races. And but it's something I'm just going to say, we've not even talked through questions of like what even means to talk about races and the way that has changed over time, but I'll just bracket that. And at each point, that has been, you know, it's been justified in different ways with different kinds of science. But, you know, now we look back and we say, oh, man, they did not know what they were talking about. That was ridiculous. I mean, look at what was going on in their society. But they, you know, they looked and they ran their studies and they, they ran the numbers and they said, you know, um, there's just a difference here. There's a difference here. And that is why things are, are turning out the way they are. I tell me why. Tell me why it is unfair to put Ezra, I'm pointing out that the bias to put your conversation in that lineage, why the burden of proof is not actually on you to say, here's why it is different this time. Here is why we are at a point either in American history or science or whatever, where that that is no longer like we are certain that nobody in 50 years is going to look back at us and say that because scientifically what what the scientists who are on my side of this argument think and they include James Flynn and many others they say that's where we are here not quite but okay they, well i just quoted him to you i just spoke, again i just spoke to him 2 days well, ago well, yeah, no but it, it was it was still it was still a misleading summary of what he said i know i know I, what, what he's on record okay. saying I, again here. i just spoke to him and he and and you're interpreting it in a way he, that you no like. i'm not interpreting james that, flynn just said to me 2 days ago that it is it is consistent I, I, with the evidence that there I, is a genetic I understand advantage what you said. or disadvantage for African Americans. That it is entirely possible that the ten point IQ difference we see reflects a twelve point environmental difference and a negative two um, genetic difference. Uh, that, sure, sure. Many things are possible. We're trying to judge on what is plausible to say, and more important, I am worried about the social penalty for talking about these things because, again. It will come back to us on things that we don't expect, like the Neanderthal thing, right? Like that comes out of left field. Had it gone another way, all of a sudden we can't talk about Neanderthal DNA anymore. And there's no point in having our politics be hostage to these kind of tripwire effects where you say something that seems politically invidious, merely talking about the data as they are. I mean, if it, unless every population of human beings has exactly the same mean and the same variance for every trait we care about, we are guaranteed to be blindsided by these differences that seem important to people who care about differences among groups. The, the end game here is to not care about differences among groups, to treat individuals as individuals, and to realize that, that yes, people have different sets of gifts and competences, we can give people whatever advantages we can, and we should. We're moving into a future where we'll be able to change these things about ourselves in very intrusive ways. We'll be able to change our genes. We'll be able to change the genes of our kids. We'll be able to put technology directly into our brains. And not everyone will have access to this technology at the same time. And, and this will open a door to another aspect of inequality that could be hugely consequential. This is all stuff that we have to get ready for. But the way to be ready is for good and intellectually honest people to be willing to talk about the facts of biology and various things we understand about things like intelligence without losing sight of our political and ethical commitments to one another. And those commitments just have to be to make the world better and to treat everyone fairly and to treat one's political opponents fairly. And there's a real shortage of people who can do this right now, Ezra. And you're style of dealing with this is part of that problem. It is why, again, I mean, you, you haven't commented on this. I'll give you another example because you, you don't like the examples I've given. I mean, I've given you Southern Poverty Law Center. I've given the fact that I, I've got scientists contacting me who won't go on the record, who fully support me and Murray. But I mean, take Andrew Sullivan. I think he's a mutual friend of ours. I mean, he's a, certainly a, a friend of mine. He came to my and Murray's defense. I assume you don't think Andrew's a racist. He merely for coming out down on our side of this particular contretemps, he's being slimed as a racist now. Okay, that is the environment in which we're having this conversation, and that's why I'm that's what I would call a moral panic. It's not good, and again, we're going to be continually played by new data. And the basic principle here, scientifically, which Turkheimer's allied in, and you seem to want him to allied it or you seem to be happy that he elided it, is that, yes, it is safe to say that there are genetic 
differences among genetically isolated populations. Uh, and your point about the conceptual coherence of race is well taken, but it, it, there is, based on the ancestry of all the 7 billion human beings that currently exist, there are differences among groups. I mean, the fact that you can look at someone and the fact that you can look at me and know that I'm not Korean just by looking at me is a sign of my genetic ancestry. The fact that you can make a best guess as to where someone's ancestors came from is a sign. Whether we're looking for differences among groups or not, we'll be surprised by things. Yes, it's true that, as Turkheimer said, sorry, as Reich said, we may have things completely backwards. We'll find out that certain stereotypes are the opposite of being true. But we might find out that certain stereotypes are true. I mean, you know, Turkheimer used an example in one of his pieces, I think it was the second one, where he said, what if someone does a genetic analysis of materialism or finds, you know, you know multivariate genes that co-vary with, with a person's materialism, and we find that these genes are overexpressed among Jews? What then? Right now, he put, he put this out as though, like, this was going to be so radioactive that, you know, it's just going to bowl me over or bowl anyone over who's, you know, didn't care about the black-white data, but will all of a sudden care about the Jewish data. I mean, that's, that's like a perfectly legitimate question. I'm not suggesting anyone study that. And I, again, I would worry about the ethics of anyone who, want, in the wilderness of all possible things to study, wanted to devote his or her life to studying that. But that's the kind of thing that could just emerge from, you know, the study of hoarding behavior. If someone studies the psychological problem of hoarding, and they study the genetics of it, and then they just happen to discover that the genetics are represented differently in different populations. And Ashkenazi Jews, of which, you know, half of my ancestry is, have more of this, the hoarding genes than other people. Do we deal with that like adults? Or do we vilify the person who merely spoke about the data? That's the, that's the bright line I'm trying to get you to acknowledge. 